Well, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. We've been going through these, this book of Revelation and I uh, uh, hope it isn't getting to be too much for you because, uh, you know, somebody asked me uh, the other day, when do we get to the graceful Jesus? You know, when do we get the Jesus that, that, that's the happy Jesus? And, and uh, evidently in, in, in Revelation, this picture of Jesus that we see, he's pretty stern and he's warning and he's concerned for the church and for those who call themselves the church. And uh, we, as we've seen the, these warnings and, and what he's bringing to these seven churches, it isn't something just for those seven churches. It is for the church as a whole, for all of us together, that this is a word for us, that God is speaking something to us. Because we're challenged several times to, with, for those that have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And every one of you have an ear. We all have an ear to hear. We're all to be aware of what Jesus is, is warning and speaking to these churches. And, and today we're going to be in the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to jump in in verse 1 and, and get after this thing. And Please uh, open your Bibles to Revelation 3. Beginning in the first verse, he says... To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, let, let, let's just stop right there. We'll dig in a little bit further, but, but let, let's talk about what we're seeing here. We're seeing in, in this first part, we see Jesus and the representation that he comes with, how he identifies himself. And each church has a different way that he identifies himself. And he says, I'm the one holding the seven stars. I'm the one who has the seven spirits. And, and, and that could be kind of confusing. Like, what are this, the seven spirits of God? You mean there's more than just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, well no. What, what it's, when it's talking about the seven spirits, it, it, it's probably better translated as the sevenfold spirit. That, there, that, that there's the, the completeness that's drawn in with this number seven. Seven means a whole, the whole spirit. That's why we see the letters to the seven churches. It's the whole church that's represented there. And with the seven spirits, it's the complete spirit. And guess who the only one is who has the complete spirit? Jesus. Or God. You, God, that's a good answer too. Right on. That's what we say in Sunday school. If you don't know the answer, Jesus or God. That's always the answer. So, you're good. You're good there, right? So he, he, he's the one that brings the Spirit. And without Him, there is no access to that Spirit. It only comes from Him. It, it, it's, it's in His hands. And then he talks about the seven stars. And, and we know the seven stars were the seven messengers. The, seven, uh, it, it, the Bible, as it's translated from, it says the seven angels. To, the, to that angel, to that messenger. But this isn't an angelic being, as we talked about before. Because God, if He wanted to talk to an angel, He doesn't need God to do it. He can speak to the angels. He doesn't need John to do that. But this messenger is an earthly messenger. It's the, it would be the, the messenger of that church. And to the, he, he's, he's letting them know, I'm holding those messengers, those pastors, those leaders within that church. I'm holding them in my hand. And I can think of nothing more comforting than to know that we're in his hand today. That he's holding us. That he's got us. Amen. And, and, and he tells them, you know, we, I hear a lot of things all the time. I, I, I went to do a, uh, uh, went and visited with some people the other day and saw them and they said, oh, I've just heard so many good things about new beginnings. To which I thought, I'm glad it was good things. Because <laughs> I hear a lot of people say a lot of bad things about new beginnings. Uh, it, 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 it's just, it's good to hear somebody say something good. But, you know, we, th there's a reputation that, that Jesus is commending the church for. He said, oh, you got this. Everybody speaks well of you. You have the reputation of being alive. So much so, it's, it's like they put the name above the door. This is life, church. We're a church that is alive, that we're moving, that we're flowing. I bet they even had a great worship team. Okay, maybe not. But... I, you know, I bet it was one of those places that everybody was like, man, if you're going to go to church, go to Sardis. 
Sardis Assembly or, or Sardis, you know, whatever you want to call it. Sardis Church. That's the, go there. Because that place, man, it's happening there. Great things are happening. The church is growing there. Things, it, it, it just, it's alive. And though they had a great reputation for being a church that was alive, Jesus said, you're dead. You're dead. You've got everybody fooled, but you're dead. You're dead. A lot of us, we, we, we have a reputation that we're, we're so worried about, and we want to keep a good reputation in the community. We want people to think highly of us. But when we were all by ourselves, we really know who we really are. We, we know that, hey man, I'm a snake. Uh, I, I hope nobody finds out all my dirty laundry, all my dark secrets. i got to keep this stuff hidden that nobody would find out. You know, whenever you try to keep something hidden, it has a way of exploding. And then all of a sudden, everybody knows all of your ugly. And you tried to give that front. A lot of us, can you just imagine, you go to a funeral one day. And you, you realize it, it's your funeral. That you've died and you've gone on and everybody that came to speak at that funeral said, hey, what a great person you were. How awesome it was to know you. They, 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 this guy, he was it. Only to go to Jesus and him say, mm, I didn't know you. But God, they all thought I was good. They listen to all they have to say, God. They're just saying a lot of great things about me down there. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter. I didn't know you. You're still dead. See, all that reputation is going to go out the window. It all falls apart. And the thing that's going to remain is who are you really? Are you really alive? Or are you just dead and playing a role. We're real good at that. We're real good at being posers. At pretending to be something that we're really not. Hey, have you ever been on a date, guys? It's all about fooling them. Is it not? I was there. I mean, I, I, I bathed regularly whenever I knew she was going to be around. Whenever I wanted to, to, to impress her, I, I spoke a certain way. I mean, after I started preaching at the church here, one of the things my wife said is, what happened to you? You like revert into this hick thing when you start talking. I said, I can't help that. It's just the way I talk. It's who I am. I'm sure she's thinking, I wish I would have known this. Way ahead of time. It might have changed things. I mean, you are the safest driver when you get in the car. You hit a bump. Oh, are you okay over there? Yeah, the seat has cushions. I'm okay. Every little thing, you're, you're, you're trying to put on your best front, your best face. And then you get married, and they're like, what happened? Who is this guy? <laughs> hey, I wasn't going to go there. I can only speak for me and how phony I was. My wife, came, it was an open book. I knew everything. She, was, she did, didn't fake anything. And, and I'm probably lying in that. But <laughs> we all have this, this face that we want everybody else to see. But when we're alone and we're by ourselves, who are you? Who are you? What do you see when it's only you? What do you think? We call that integrity. Because it's who are you when you're by yourself? Who are you when you think nobody's looking? When you think the cop isn't on the on-ramp anymore? When you think God is not looking at this? It's like three in the morning. Is God really watching me? Yes. He is. And who are you when nobody else is there to put on the mask for it. Are you alive? Really alive? Or are you dead and pretending? 
What does it look like in your life? Well, verse 2, I like this. Wake up. But you see the exclamation after it? That doesn't mean he's just like, hey guys, wake up. It means he's like, wake up! Wake up! Come on! He wants you to get something here. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. I found your deeds unfinished? What? Because it isn't about what you do. It isn't about how good you can be. If you can be the best you can be. And you know what? I guarantee you there are people in hell right now that were ten times better than you could ever be. And their good deeds, the deed, their works, fell terribly short. And it's unfinished. It's not complete because it's missing Him. It's missing Jesus. And without Jesus, none of it matters. None of it. Every good deed that you try to put forth, everything you're trying to show. Yeah, we're encouraged to do good things. We're told, hey, do help the poor. We're told, we're commended to help the needy. We're, we're told to do this, but not so we can be saved, but because we are. Because we are. But I don't care how, how much you do, if you don't have Jesus, it all falls short. And he's saying, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. It, 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 when he's talking to these people in Sardis, the thing about Sardis is they thought they were invincible. They, the way they were located on the top of a mountain with sheer drop-off cliffs on three sides and only one way in. All they had to do was defend the entrance coming in and they could stop any enemy. And they were under siege. And while they were under siege, one of the opposing uh, leaders said, I I'll, give, I I'll reward any man who can find a way into that city. And one day as they're camped out around this, this towering city that rose above them with cliff walls on three sides, one of the soldiers from inside the city looked out over the wall. And as he looked out, he, his helmet fell. Fell to the ground. And, and, and they, they noticed that the, the helmet had fell. And they thought, well, how's he ever going to get that? He just lost his helmet. A little while later, they noticed him coming down the side of the mountain. And that he, there was a path that they didn't know about, but that the people who lived in the city knew about it. And they watched him come down the side of the mountain and get his helmet and go right back up. And they said, that's our way. So he went to his leader. He told them, I found a way in. We can go in. It's going to take some time, but we can do it. So they waited for the city to go to sleep. And while they were asleep, the enemy crept in the back door, climbed in, entered the city through the secret passage, and the city fell. So when he's telling Sardis, wake up, wake up, they understand. The enemy came while we were sleeping. We fell. Our city was, was destroyed. It was overtaken because we slept through it. We slept through it. We, we, we didn't pay attention to what we needed to pay attention to. And he's telling us in the same way, wake up. Don't let the enemy sneak in on you. Be aware. Be alert. The enemy's at your gate. He wants to destroy you. Wake up. Let's fight this thing. Let's get on the right side of this. Remember, therefore, verse 3, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Wake up. wake up because I'm coming I'm coming 
James chapter 1 and verse 22. It says, don't merely be hearers of this word. But he says to be doers also. Don't just play a part. Don't just come to church and let us tickle your ears with all the pretty words that I speak. And that is a joke. In my hick, ignorant vernacular. Don't let the words just tickle your ears. Don't just listen to it. But it tells us to be a doer also. Do what is being said. Do what God is telling you to do. Don't just look the part. You come in here. Oh, you look pretty. You look so nice and, and, and dressed up in your Sunday finest. I could say that was a joke, but I won't. But you, you come in with your best foot forward. You come in looking your best. You, 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 got the, you want people to see, I'm changed, bless the Lord. But as you hear the message, you walk out the same way you came in. I'm not saying all of us are doing that, but there are those that will leave this place the same, in the same death that they walked in the door in. And they hear what's being said, but it's not changing. There's, there's not, they're not listening to the, the caution. They're not listening to Jesus explain to them that they need to wake up. Do what He says. Do what He's asking of us. Don't just sell yourself short and, and just sit there. Don't, don't just hear it. Hearing it's not enough. Good works are not enough. We've got to be in His presence. We've got to surrender who we are to Him. We've got to let Him take control. Because there's a, sadly, there are those of us here who need to wake up. Who need to come to a realization of who He is and who we are. There are those of us here that are dead in our sin. In this very room. I said, but I do a lot of good stuff. So did the people in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verse beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, there's going to be those that are going to come before me who said, Lord, Lord. They were real religious. Oh, they, they, they came in. They, 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 they played the role, man. Lord, Lord. He said, there's going to be those who come to say, Lord, Lord. And he's, they, they're going to come before Him. And, and they're going to say, look at all the good things we did. Laid hands on the sick and man, I, was, I had a healing ministry. I drove demons out of people, Lord. And what's he going to tell them? I don't know you. I don't know you. And we look at our lives and we think, well, I'm going for sure. I'm in. Ain't no doubt about it, man. I'm good. I'm gold. I mean, look at all I do. I go to work. And I make a paycheck. And I pay my house note. And uh, every once in a while, I'll see somebody on a corner somewhere, and I'll tell them, hey, Jesus loves you, as I roll down my window and roll it right back up going down the road. You know, I, I, I may even, you know, pass out a track somewhere here or there. I, you know, I, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. You, know, you, need, you need somebody to pray with you. I'll pray with you, man. How, look at what these people did. And he still said, they never knew me. They, they had healing ministries. They had deliverance ministries. They were doing great things, things that we would be like, I want that guy to come preach in my church. And yet he's still going to talk to me. He says, I don't know you. I don't know you. We talk about this, this security that we find in, in Christ. And, and they're, the, the, they're thinking, man, I'm in for sure. And they come to Jesus and Jesus says, you didn't make it. Because all the stuff you did, you left it unfinished and incomplete. Because the biggest thing that you missed was Jesus himself. Man, I read this passage this week, and man, I feel like I got so beat up. Because I thought, God, please, 
Don't let that be me. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that guy. That, oh, you got a great reputation, but when it's all said and done, where do I belong? What's in it? Am I really living for you? Where do I fit in this? I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be you. Wake up. Wake up. Because today is your day. Today's the day where all that can change, where you can say, I, I don't want to be the one who falls asleep on the job, who thinks everything's just great, and then I wake up one day and everything's falling apart. And I've got to go and I've got to stand before God. Because we don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, nobody... I don't know when my last day is. I mean, I can go online and get the app. <laughs> they have an app for that, by the way. Death clock. You put in all your information and it tells you, you're going to die this day. Not something I really care to know. It's just an app. Don't believe it. But I, you, you, we don't know, we're not told when our last breath is going to be taken on this earth. There are those who think, man, I got 20 years at least. You know, I, I didn't smoke. I, I, you know, I eat fatty foods. You know, you never know. But you put it in the app and, and you know, it'll tell you, you know, I got to like 64. But anyway, you got... <laughs> we don't know when our last breath is going to be taken. You... Yeah, and I've heard it so many times before, and I, I'm going to tell you the same thing. You could drive out of this parking lot and get nailed by an 18-wheeler. Nobody is promised tomorrow. None of us. We don't know when it's going to happen, so it's time to wake up and take care of business now. You may be the one that you're fooling. but we can have that new life. If you're, what you're bringing to God today is like, look at all the great stuff I've done. This is why I should go to heaven. Then you've got the wrong thing. I don't get to go to heaven because I'm a pastor of a church. I don't get to go to heaven because of all the great things that I've done. Which if I wrote them down, it would be a terribly short list, I feel. But that isn't why I get to go. I get to go because Jesus is my Savior. And without Him, all of the good doesn't matter. And i got to quit fooling myself. I've got to wake up. I've got to stop playing the part. And we all know the game. You know what people think that you should do in church because I've seen many of people offended in this church by the things that have happened in this church. Did you hear what they said? And in church. Said they probably said it everywhere else too. Why are we so shocked by this? Well, in church, it's supposed to be different. You know, there are things that I could do as a pastor that every one of you, in, in all of your, 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 your thoughts of, hey, there's grace and liberty. I, I, I could go some places and do some things, go some places where you might go. And if you saw me there, you'd be like, but he's the pastor. He's not supposed to be here. You have that, you, you're already thinking of a place that you go to that you're like, if he ever went there, I'd be like, whoa. <laughs> Pastors aren't supposed to be here. Because we have this criteria and we have markers and boundary markers and things that we think, well, that's what a pastor should do and this is what other people do. But you know what? There's no difference between me as a pastor and you. None. None. Because I, I, I'm a minister because God called me to be a minister. And you're a minister because God called you to be a minister. I never got that memo. He called me what? Yes. He called you. He saved you. I don't care if you've been saved the day. He wants you to start telling people about him. That's what he wants from you. You are a minister 
of this new covenant that we've been given. And we all have this religious mindset. Things that, that people of God should and should not do. And as long as I do those things, God will be happy. Man. Yeah, the things we do are important. They are. But that's not the thing that saves you. It's the thing you do because He saved you. And without the salvation, all the good stuff that you could imagine just leads you straight to hell. That's what it does. We think that there's this righteousness that we can achieve. And it's not. It's not. We fall terribly short. And we're told he's going to come as a thief. Other times, Jesus, in, in Matthew 24 and 42 through 44, he's encouraging, be ready. Be ready, because you don't know when I'm coming. We can see, we're told that we can see the signs and the seasons, and we can know it's getting close. And I'm going to tell you, if you haven't seen the signs and the seasons, and you don't, you don't realize it's close. He's coming. And it says he's going to come as a thief in the night. And it says if you knew the hour that the thief was coming. You know, it wasn't too long ago. Uh, well, a couple weeks ago, somebody broke into Heart's Desire. Trashed the electrical. Uh, it just, just ripped the meters off the wall. Like that did something. I don't get it. Because then the battery backup and the lighting kicked in. So then they were like trying to put it back. And they broke in. And got in, and they had an alarm system, but man, it wasn't on. It is now. It is now. <laughs> but if we would have known they were coming, it would have been different. We would have been sitting there waiting. We would have been anxious. Oh, let's let them come in now. We thought they might come back because of some of the things that we saw. And, and Avery, God bless him, he's like, I'll camp out here, man. I'm ready. I'll do this. I, I'll stay right here. They come in here, man, I'm on them. And I'm like, they might be big guys, Avery. That might not be a good thing. They might hurt us. But if you knew they were coming, man, that Saturday night we would have been ready. We would have been anxious. We would, we would have been all about it. Hi, don't let them see us. When they come in, we'll pounce on them. Because if you knew when the thief was coming, there ain't no way he's getting away with anything. And Jesus said, it's like that for me. You don't know when I'm coming. So you better be ready. You better be ready. Because I'm going to be the one that shows up when you don't even expect it. When you think, man, we still got a long time till he comes back. I mean, there ain't even a red heifer being sacrificed on an altar yet. Somebody told me that one. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're rebuilding the tabernacle, so we got some time. Oh, maybe for that. But he could call his bride home any minute. Any minute. There's no time restraint on that. He could say, tomorrow, tonight, this, in an hour, after the Cowboys win. <laughs> he could say, come. And we would be so happy. The Cowboys won and Jesus is calling us home. <laughs> We'd be so happy. We don't know when that will come. We don't know what moment he will come as a thief in the night. We don't know when that's going to happen. So I'm telling you, Jesus is telling us, be ready. Be ready. Because he's coming back. And he wants to take you. He wants to bring you with him. But we've got to do something to be ready. And the thing we've got to do is ask Him to be our Lord and Savior. To live like He's called us to live. To change who we are into who He wants us to be. 
by inviting him into your life, by changing who we are, by living for him. See, we're dead in our sin and our trespass. We're dead without him, but with him. There's power there. Look at the next part of this. It says in verse 4, it said, Yet you have a few people in Sardis. Out of all of those in Sardis, there's a few of you. A remnant, maybe. A small gathering that he says, There are a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. What made them worthy? Was it because they had good bleach? Their washing machine worked way better than mine. Maybe they had the center agitator. I have one of those things that without the agitator in the middle, and it doesn't seem to get anything clean. It doesn't. It's terrible. I hate that thing. You buy all that for that low you know, economy washer, and it can't wash a thing, it seems like. You get, oh, I hate that thing. But I had this coat that I love that I wear to work, and it just got dirt on it, man, and it can't get the dirt off of it. Come on. But it ain't because they had good launderers. They were white because they had faith. They were white. They were, they were clean because they were, it wasn't their garment they were wearing. They had been clothed in Christ. They'd been clothed in Him. And it did all, all the other stuff. They weren't soiled anymore because of what He did for them. He made them clean. He made them white. He says, and because of what they've done, because they asked me to come into their life, because they made me their Lord and Savior, and I call the shots in their life now, because of that, because of that, they are worthy. Verse 5, the one who is victorious, the one who's clean, the one who's victorious, the one who has Jesus in their life, will, and I'm going to tell you, victory doesn't always feel like victory. It doesn't. A lot of times it hurts. A lot, you, we, you go through some things in this life. You're not going to rise three feet above the ground and float. You're going to face some things. You're going to go through some things. But the thing is, you'll go through it and you'll come out on the other side. And the fact that you made it, you're in victory. I don't care what the world throws at you, but there are going to be those who won't know that victory. Because as we walk through this world, the world sticks to them. They're full of the world. They haven't been delivered from the world. They're still in it. They're still living it. They're still being that. And they'll never know that victory. They'll never know what it's like to have their sins forgiven. They'll never know what it's like to be delivered. But with Jesus... All of that changes. We simply ask, and He comes in. He changes us. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There are those who are dressed in white. There are those who are victorious. And then there are those who are not. There are those who belong to Jesus. And there are those who, have not, who, do, who do not. And today to Sardis. To us today. What he's telling us is. Make sure you're on the right side of this. Make sure you belong to him today. And then it says, you can be dressed in white also. But wake up. Take an inventory of your life. Look at what's there. Can you say you belong to him today? Man, where's that Jesus of grace that just accepts everything? That ain't him. The grace comes in because no matter all that junk that you've done, He still says He'll take you. And today, 
He'll take you. He'll make you new. All of the stuff, the junk in your life, he take all of that filth, all of that soiled garment that you walked in the door with, and he'll give you a new robe. Romans talks about being clothed in Christ. To the point that when we stand before Jesus, when we stand before that great white throne of judgment, and, there, and those that, 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 that have come before him, and they said, we should be getting in. And he says, I don't know you. And then we're going to walk up there and they're going to go, that guy gets in? He gets in? You're letting her in the door? And I'm not getting in? This is rigged. And I'm going to tell you, it is rigged. Because it's all about him. And as God, the devil stands up there and we're told he's the accuser of the brethren. That's what Satan means. He's the accuser. And as he slanders and throws his accusations, and you're probably guilty of everything the devil's going to say. You know that? You're going to be so gay. He's going to pull out that scroll. It's going to roll 30 feet that way. And he's going to start going through the checklist. Look at what this guy did. He's guilty of this. He's guilty of that. He, he, and you know what Jesus is going to say? After all of that, God's going to look at you. God's going to sit on that. He's going to look at you and he's going to say, I don't see that. All I see is Jesus. All I see is Jesus. The challenge for us today is to make sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. That you're not just paying lip service to something. That you're not playing a role in doing what you think God tells you to do, but doing literally what He says to do. You're like, well, how do I know that? Oh, I got the answer. It's right here. You can know what he's asking of you. Yeah, but I need to know. What is God's will for my life? I need to know. Does he want me to do this thing or that thing? I'll tell you what. He, open this up. Get this down. And all that other stuff, it'll fall into place. Do this stuff. Let's work on this. And, 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 and it all works out. But don't be fooled. Don't be that guy that goes to, stands before Jesus one day and says, I really thought I was getting in. Everybody else did too. I had a great reputation. Everybody loved me. But then now, I'm not getting in. Make sure you are on the right side of eternity. Don't walk out of here saying, well, I prayed a prayer once. I did that thing, you know, and yeah, man, it's, I'm good. Really? Who are you when nobody's looking? What's there that shouldn't be there? Is he the Lord of your life or is he the Lord of everybody else that's standing around? Are you blending in because this is what people do? Because it ain't about playing a part anymore. It's about being the real deal. It's about living your life for Him, surrendering who you are to Him. And if you haven't done that, don't leave here. Don't walk out of here the same. Wake up. Give all that you are to Him. And you can do it today. You're like, man, I still got these things I want to do. Well, that's fine. Go ahead, run. Do your thing. You can be miserable out there. You can do that. Just make sure you, you, you wake up before it's too late. Amen. Don't come in here and fool up. You know, don't, we, you know, somebody once told me you can't con a con. And I'm going to tell you, there's people around you that know, hey, that guy jacked. <laughs> and you may you think, oh, hey, I did that thing. I did, I'm good. You know, I, I got that all. I got everything out of the way. I can keep being who I want to be. Well, if that's your mentality, you're not who you're supposed to be. Wake up. Be ready. Let Jesus become Lord of your life. And I promise you, it'll change everything. It will be the greatest ride you'll ever go on. 
It'll be the greatest thing that could ever happen in your life when you surrender who you are to who he is. And you can do that today. You can make that decision. And I know there's going to be a lot of you that are going to walk out of here unchanged. Determining to be the person that you've always been. Don't do it. Answer that call. Today is the day of your salvation. Today. Because there'll be a time when he's through dealing. When he's through offering. And where will you be? Wake up. Repent before it's too late. Can we pray together? <clears throat> Jesus, as we come before you, Lord, you know where we stand. You know our hearts. You know the thought, the deep things in each of us, God. And God, I pray that you would convict us today. That if we don't know you, if, we, if we're not on the right side of this thing, God, please, deal with us, Lord. Show us the way. Show us what you have for us. Call us to you today. Let us be changed by you. Save us from the sin that is wrecking us and make us new today. Take just a moment. Look at your life. Ask yourself that question. Am I His? Do I belong to Him today? Because if you don't know Jesus, if, you, if, if everything isn't adding up right, let's start all over. Let's start fresh, new. Let's make Him Lord of our life today. If you're in this place and you need Jesus, you need Him to touch you. You can ask him to come in, and he will. You can surrender your life to him today. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've been. He forgives. He forgives all of it. And you can be a new creation today. He's here for you. Don't put it off too long. Would you stand with me? I want to give you the opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, you can know Him today. It can be a scary thing at first to think, to think that I need to give myself to Jesus. What, what's, good, what's it going to be like? What's going to happen? I'm going to tell you, you're going to come alive today. Life will enter. He'll give you His Holy Spirit as a deposit and a guarantee. But it isn't just that. It's an empowering as well. And you can live life like you've never lived it before. And you can experience life more abundant. You can know what it's like to be loved by your Creator. To live for your Creator. All you've got to do is ask Him in. 
You can pray that prayer. You can, you can tell him how sorry you are. You can, you can ask him to come in and set you free, and he'll do it. But please, if you don't know Jesus today, don't leave here without him. Say, well, I'm not sure what I need to say. Then come see me. I would love to introduce you to my God today. I would love for this to be the first day of life in you. And you can know Him today. Could we all, just right where you're at, just be in prayer for those around you because there are those here that need Jesus today. That need Him to save their life, to touch their life today. Just enter into that, that intercession, enter into that, that place where you can pray for those around you. As Bill plays, th- th- these next few moments, eternity is in the balance. Someone here needs Jesus. You can be dismissed in a few minutes. you, you got plenty of time. You say, well, I'm good. I got Jesus. Then pray. Pray for those around you that don't. But if you're one of those that doesn't know Jesus today, that you don't have Him, it... it, it, it Maybe you prayed a prayer a long time ago, but man, you just still feel so lost. We can wipe the slate clean today. We can start all new. So if you need Jesus today, I want to ask you to come. We'll pray with you. And you'll leave this place changed. So if you need Jesus, please come.